Excellent. Um, again, thank you for having me, uh, Adam, at this, uh, at this. I just want to start a little, bit, a little bit by talking about my experience and what we do at PwC One Analytics team. Uh, in the beginning of my presentation, it's going to be very, very similar to uh, what we just saw uh, from, uh, from KPMG. Uh, I have been, just like Debbie, I've been in, in academia, I've also been in professional services, but in the middle of these two, I've also been part of the Montreal um, uh, entrepreneurship community. So I have, I know how it feels like to work in academia, I know how it feels like to work in a startup, and I also know, uh, I know how it feels like to work in a, in a big four firm. Um, I, I find myself to have a very natural fit with uh, within uh, PwC One Analytics team, which is our internal name for uh, for the group of very bright minds that work across the value chain of anything data. And here on the screen, you can see on a very you know on a thirty thousand foot view of the seven big uh, buckets of work that the One Analytics uh, Analytics team uh, does. Uh, just one quick note about uh, PwC is that PwC, in contrast to other big four firms, we're not one big organization that have different branches or different offices. We are a network of firms that operate under the same brand, and each territory has its own PwC. So, for example, I work with PwC Canada for PwC Canada, but I also have access to the rest of the uh, very bright minds that work on different PwC territories. Um, at PwC One Analytics, we're about uh, 80 and growing across Canada. We call it One Analytics because we don't have a data science group in Montreal, a data science group in Toronto, and so on. We're basically one big national team and growing. Uh, part of our team works on um, data strategy, data governance, basically preparing our clients to get to a situation where they're confident about the data that they have and they can start using uh, those data to generate value, such as looking into uh, revenue growth, or market growth, or uh, creating some strategy for making more money or providing more specialized or personalized services to their clients. Um, we also have uh, basically some, some of our group works on basically data analysis in the financial sector. So mostly focused on financial crime. So we do a lot of machine learning on financial uh, data, uh, specifically for anti-money laundering and other fraud detection activities. Um, think about private sector, think about insurance and so on. Another part of our more tech heavy uh, job, that job or projects that we do is what you see on the left-hand side, mostly on the intelligent automation, Responsible AI, which is where I sit, as well as the analytics transformation. The use case that I'm going to focus on today is one of the most recent AI implementations that we've done for one of our clients in the energy sector. And it combines multiple technologies from uh, search, from information retrieval, from NLP, and so on to, uh, to basically create efficiency for one of our clients. The, the specific use case that I have in mind is what we've done for a nuclear power plant in, uh, in central Canada, which is responsible for up to 30% of the power that's generated and distributed in, uh, in the central Canada region. What they have is they have multiple nuclear reactors, and these nuclear reactors, just like any other machine in use, they require periodical maintenance. And I'm going to run a very, very oversimplistic analogy here is that you're a homeowner and some, at some point you figure out that you need to change a light bulb in your living room because it's out, right? And what you need to do is you need to plan how you're going to change that uh, light bulb. So you think about what do I need? So I need to discard the previous light bulb. I need a new light bulb with a specific specification or what. I probably need a ladder. I need to go up before turning off the, light, the, the bad light bulb, I need to probably cut the current so I don't get electrocuted and stuff like that. So there's a whole planning that goes around that. And you, I want you to be able to kind of transfer that analogy to a nuclear reactor that needs maintenance. So these uh, reactors have to be shut down in order for the maintenance to happen. And there is a, there is a ton of steps. There is a lot of tasks that needs uh, to happen and be conducted by the engineers and the maintenance workforce for this nuclear to be maintained, to be repaired, and for it to back up, to be back up again. This is a very, very lengthy, this is a, a very labor-intensive effort. 
so much so that outage outage planning usually starts two years before the intended date. So if we're in 2021, there's they are planning for the outage that's going to happen in two years from now. It is a very uh, lengthy process. There is usually about a dozen people involved, different department, departments involved. Um, each part of the planning, because it has to go through multiple revisions for it to get uh, Q8, um, there's a bit of a handoff that happens. So just the bit of part that we are focusing and trying to automate, it takes about three months, uh, 10 people full time working on it. So you can, you can see that it's a very, very expensive piece of work. Being a very, very manual uh, process, we thought when talking to a client that maybe we can use some of their historical data to do to do somewhat of an automation um, in this pro in this in this basically domain. Uh, the focus here was on work efficiency and reducing the number of days or the time that the uh, the nuclear reactor is off. Uh, because we were told that every extra day that they go beyond the critical path of fixing those nuclear reactors, they, they're using up to a million dollar in distribution of, of, uh, of electricity. So what we did is that we started talking to the client, we identified the key stakeholders. We had two departments that were working with us, uh, the work management. So these are the people that actually schedule what needs to be done at when and what order and basically what materials they need, what workforce they need, what labor is needed, and basically time box all those activities. We also started talking to the IT department because this is going to be a new AI solution that is being deployed at a nuclear station. So this was a brand new offering to them. There was a big appetite, but there was also a very, very big learning curve that everybody at the client had to go through. Uh, so for example, one of the uh, distinguishing like the factor about this project was that this was their first experience with any cloud-based technology. So part of our implementation also was a bit of a hand-holding and knowledge transfer on how they can have their own instance and have this um, basically production-ready system running on their side without the PwC help. So what we did is that we said, okay, so what we can do is that for an upcoming outage, when somebody on their work uh, management department says certain pieces of a reactor needs to be repaired or maintained or replaced, they, what they do as humans is usually they create a, a skeleton of a project where at a very high level, they describe what needs to be done. So everything is in text. Um, their main application is Primavera 6. It's a very popular application for workforce management. And on the left-hand side, you can see that it's a, a, in the current state. Everything that you see in a reddish color, that's everything that needs to be done manually. And that takes three months and several several revision for that, um, for that schedule to be okayed, to be passed on to the next department and ending up at the hands of the maintenance workers. So what we thought is that maybe if we can go through your historical data, basically log of the maintenance that you had before, for an upcoming uh, maintenance work, if we can find a similar one, then we can automatically uh, schedule the, the, the repair work and just have the human do a bit of a sanity check or maybe some quality assessment before we hand out, handing it to the maintenance workers. So if you compare the left-hand side with the future state, the beginning of a project, which is a human that just puts in the skeleton of the project, it's still the same because, well, the AI doesn't know what needs to be repaired. It's a human that tells the AI what needs to be repaired and the AI takes it from there. So we replace big box of uh, manual labor with, with an AI model that would produce that, um, basically the work order that needs to be done and we'll give it back to the, uh, the humans at the station to do their quality check. At a very high level, there, there are four parts to the solution. First part uh, is where you get the description of the work that needs to be done. For example, the light bulb in the basement needs to be changed, right? Now we'll translate that into something that they do on a nuclear uh, reactor. What we do is that we get the description of that work and then we go over 10 years worth of historical data to figure out if we have done this before. If we have done this before, then we bring over the ta the, the uh, every data that's associated with that work. We bring over the tasks. Um, just to give you an idea, there are 25,000 different tasks to choose from. And now 
uh, experts in work management, they exactly, they know, they have this organizational memory. They know they've been doing it uh, manually for 20 years. So they go and they search in a database for that task. And it takes a lot of time, as you can imagine. But for an AI, it can happen in a few seconds, right? So we we find the right work order. For example, when we did uh, when when we did uh, a light bulb change in the past, we bring over all the tasks. We do the scheduling. We show it back to the human. If it's okay, it ends up in the schedule. What happens here specifically is that we have trained models, uh, work to VEC NLP models, language models that we develop that we trained on their historical data. And what we do is that we first do a semantic similarity between the description of the work that needs to be done with every single piece of work that we've done in the past for that nuclear reactor. And if we find something like that, uh, we, find, we do a match, we bring over all the tasks, we do the logic ties, and we show them back uh, to the client. In that case, if, for example, the, the human workers forget to include a certain task that they used to do before, but they forgot to include in the schedule, the AI also has the capability to kind of nudge the uh, human workers and say, hey, well, you used to do 10 tasks for changing the light bulb, but you, but I only see eight a task in the schedule. Maybe these other two is something that you forgot and you can also add into the scheduling. One important thing is that when you want to do a repair, for example, a repair piece of work, there's a logical sequence of tasks that needs to happen, right? You have to put the ladder, go up the ladder to be able to change the ball. You can't just change the ball and then put the ladder up. And this is something that we also trained our AI to be able to identify and do that logic tying of the task itself. But we also went further and we embedded graph theory to be able to detect whether we're creating any logical loops, right? So we don't want to tell the maintenance workers to do A and then B and then A again, right? So we, the AI was also able to find its own defects and basically fix them. Very simple architecture. Everything is uh, developed based on the Azure stack. Uh, we have we get the data, the historical data from the client. We bring them over to Azure uh, a SQL Server. We train our uh, Python models on them. We do our magic in the Python to do the scheduling, to create an output. We push it back to the SQL Server and the client just pulls it into their system. So imagine that before their workers uh, need to come and man, like log into their P6 environment and do everything manually, but now every morning when they come and they, they're supposed to work on a schedule, they get this brand new schedule that was uh, populated by an AI and they only need to go through the steps and figure out if there are any other uh, problems. You have the usual suspects. So the platform, it was completely developed based on Azure, has a native integration with Azure. Uh, SQL Server, Python, everything was using Pandas, um, really easy data frames. From then, uh, from the on the NLP side, we relied on NLTK for a lot of pre-processing of the text. Uh, we used Google Word to Vec. Uh, we used uh, GenSim, other other models that were in GenSim to be able to train the models on their historical data and be able to uh, do the do the do the matching and bring over the populated schedules for them. So this is just one project. We learned a lot. The, the client is seeing huge, huge uh, gain in efficiency. So we, I think we cut down their work from three months to 48 hours. So now their workforce time is freed up to do more value added task or just doing QA or more efficient work rather than just going through 25,000 tasks to create just one schedule. And this project, we've I've only showed it to you for one of our clients, but we were able to also replicate it for a different nuclear reactor in a different region, still in Canada, with pretty much the same infrastructure, just different data. So it was very, very um, re um, replicable across. And now two of the Canada's biggest nuclear stations are now using this very intelligent uh, scheduling solution. Uh, for freeing up their uh, staff workforce. Uh, we, are, we still have a lot of uh, other presence in the, in the AI and energy. Uh, happy to talk more about that during the, during the networking session.